Hi, we're on to chapter 8 of Learning to Fall, The Blessings of an Imperfect Life by Philip Simmons. And chapter 8 bears the title, Choosing the World. <clears throat> Here we go. My family and I recently spent two weeks out west looking at big things, volcanoes, canyons, oceans, redwoods. Exhilarating as it is, beauty on such a scale wearies me. Such great gobs of creation, to be stuffed through the visual cortex, wrestled into thoughts, hoisted into memory. I feel too small for the job, as though I've been asked to measure the Columbia River with a thimble. After looking at big things, it's a relief to come back to New Hampshire at berry picking time to focus on small ones, raspberries first, then a feast of blue. But it's a funny thing, standing in a berry patch, pinching fruit gently between my fingertips, I feel smaller still. In fact, when I attend to the smallest things, when I hand myself over to moss or mushroom, berry or beetle, I myself shrink to vanishing. This isn't as bad as it sounds, however. In fact, it's the reason we do such things. Anyone who spent time on her knees in a berry patch or flower bed comes to see this attention to small things as a form of prayer, a way of vanishing for one sweet hour into whatever crumb of creation we are privileged to take into our hands. If you have a transcendentalist streak, then at these moments of heightened attention to the visible world, you feel closer to the invisible one. You may feel with Emerson that, quote, the visible creation is the terminus or the circumference of the invisible world, end quote. And if you feel, as I do, a yearning to be closer to God, perhaps there's no better place to be than in a berry patch. This berry lifted to my lips is a simple, material fact, but one made sweeter by the thought that, quote, a fact is the end or last issue of spirit, end quote. Emerson again. But like Emerson, I worry that if I see the blueberry only as the visible mark of some greater invisible reality, then no matter how sweet, the berry becomes second rate a step removed from what really counts. In this view, the poor, profane berry, whose powdered blue I rub to glossy black, is at best a gateway to the sacred world, at worst an illusion and fraud. In my fixation on berries, I become a prisoner in Plato's cave, entertained by shadows. Emerson's geometry is telling. If the visible world is but the circumference of the invisible one, then we're forever outside the sacred circle at whose center God lies. Only in mystic vision or death do we enter in, though even in death we may be denied. According to many religious traditions, including Christian ones, my attachment to the things of this world disqualifies me for the next. The berry's sweetness is my undoing. In the Hindu tradition, I can't be released from the cycle of rebirth, of birth, suffering, and death until I can see the berry's dusky blue as a part of maya, the veil of illusion that separates me from ultimate reality. The Buddhist view is much the same, though to the Buddhists, the veil hides not the face of God, but the essential emptiness out of which all things come, and to which they return. And we know too well that according to, according to sterner Christian doctrines, a life of worldly pleasure leads to an afterlife involving skewers and flames. These days, of course, most of us don't believe that we must choose between the world and God. Some of us have simply set aside such concerns altogether, figuring that if you have to spend any time in a cave, Plato's or otherwise, 
It might as well be one with berries in it. Even if we do worry about an afterlife, we figure that one sunny, breezy summer afternoon on the blueberry ledges may be worth a day or two in purgatory, if not in eternity rotating in the great rotisserie down below. But many of us who still believe in some sort of God have made an even more radical change from traditional ways of thinking. In the terms theologians like to use, we've moved away from notions of a transcendent God and embraced the idea of an imminent one. That is, we've gone from a distant, invisible, and otherworldly God to a God that is present and working within us and within the visible world of our experience. As Christian theologian Teilhard de Jardin writes, Christ, through his incarnation, is internal to the world, rooted in the world, even in the very heart of the tiniest atom. End quote. Jesus scholar Marcus Borg speaks for a lot of contemporary believers when he says that it's time to stop believing in God as a, quote, supernatural being out there, end quote, and time to start, quote, being in relationship with a sacred reality right here, end quote. In this view, the berry held between my fingertips is not the sign of some invisible sacred world, but a piece of sacredness itself. To taste its sweetness is to taste the divine. This way we can have our blueberry pie and eat it too. We can choose the world and in so doing, choose God. But I'm afraid I've made choosing God sound too easy. Who wouldn't choose a world of New Hampshire berry patches in July? But we all know that to embrace the world fully means choosing more than sunlit fields and berries and views of the White Mountains. <clears throat> when I began writing this essay, men with chainsaws and a bulldozer were felling trees on our property to open up more of our view of Red Hill. As exciting as this was, I somehow found it hard to fix my mind upon the idea of a transcendent deity with chainsaws snarling outside my cabin. But if God is imminent in the world, then God is imminent also in the chainsaw, or at least in the beings who would invent and use it. Choosing the world means choosing all of it, the tall maple and the severed stump. In my case, it means choosing a world that includes both black raspberry ice cream cones and my weakening arms, which will soon be unable to raise the ice cream to my lips. In choosing the world, we choose both pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow, health and illness, rapture and rue. Epimetheus, the Greek god who fashioned humans out of mud, learns this when Zeus presents him with a beautiful bride named Pandora. In accepting her, he brings pleasure, companionship, and love into his house. He also brings a curiously heavy box with instructions never to let it be opened. I remember being told this story as a child, how upset I was when Pandora, giving in to curiosity and desire, opens the box, releasing evil and death into the world. It was like the Red Sox losing in the ninth inning. We had come so close. It has taken me a long time to understand that. That like the Red Sox losing, the ending is inevitable. The box has to be opened. When Epimetheus chooses Pandora, he chooses the box too, without knowing the full implications of his choice. Merely by desiring Pandora, he has, in a sense, already opened the box. Pandora, like Eve, her counterpart in, Christian, in Hebrew scripture, brings the knowledge that good and evil are inseparable, a wisdom she bears within her woman's body, the sight of a lived and familiar intimacy between pain and pleasure, blood and birth. The story is not about distinguishing between right desires and wrong ones, 
of choosing between righteousness and sin. Rather, it tells us that desire itself, regardless of its object, enmeshes us in a world more complex than we first imagined, a world in which death and pleasure enter our homes together. No wonder so many refuse the world. We all know about the obvious refusals, alcoholism, drug addiction, violence. But even the best of us at times fail to embrace life fully. How easy it is when the world is too much with us to retreat to the sofa with a stiff drink and the remote control. But whether our evasions of the world take this or other forms, choosing the world, in the radical way I mean it, involves more than getting up off the sofa, more than just keeping busy. For I want to choose the world in such a way that I am choosing God too. Sometimes it's our very busyness that gets in the way of such a choice. Too often we anesthetize ourselves by setting up our lists and ambitions and accomplishments as a shield between us and our true selves. We strap ourselves into our carefully constructed identities for fear of letting go into the pain and wonder that awaits just the other side of our precious reserve. In a culture that recognizes busyness as the mark of importance and worth, it's so easy to use our public identities as professionals, as caretakers and volunteers, as overworked parents, to avoid all that's troubling, complex, and mysterious in the world around us. When I was a young teacher and a student came to see me with a problem, I too often retreated behind the mask of my hard-won professorial status. I wore tweed jackets on the grave expression of a man thinking deep thoughts. I was there to teach literature and write important books, I told myself, and didn't have time to help 18-year-olds adjust to living away from home. Behind my imp impatience and emotional stinginess was, of course, my own insecurity, my fear that by stepping outside the carefully policed enclosure of professional identity, I would reveal too much of my own messy humanity, which would do no one any good. Friends who are doctors tell me the same thing. How easy it is in the face of a patient's anguish and fear to maintain a carefully practiced professional reserve as a defense against empathy. And yet, as we all know, the best physicians and teachers manage somehow to express their humanity at the same time as they exercise their professional skill. When former students write to me, I'm surprised by what they remember. Books and ideas, yes, but also the smell of popcorn in my house, or the blues guitar I played once in the college coffee house, or a passing comment I made and quickly forgot, but which helped them through a difficult time. Harried, overworked, and overwhelmed as we are, we often experience our students, patients, clients, colleagues, and children as difficult, irresponsible, rude, dull, or simply too numerous to keep track of. But if we mean to choose the world, we must see God in the people who come under our care. That is, we must see them as at bottom no different from ourselves. No matter our busyness, no matter our own or others' flaws, we need at some point to see every human being as a marvel, a berry held up in sunlight, worthy of wonder. I don't mean to make it sound as though choosing the world is just a matter of being nice. Indeed, a more pernicious, pernicious because more subtle refusal of our world comes when we, re when we retreat into our own goodness. Thomas Merton, the great scholar, writer, and monastic, is especially insightful on this point. To him, choosing the world in such a way that we also choose God isn't merely a question of obeying the rules 
and avoiding sin. In fact, in Merton's more challenging view, it's often our assurance of our own goodness that blocks our approach to the divine. Merton, a Catholic, writes that the genius of Protestantism in its original radical form was its focus not on converting the wicked, but on, quote, a much more difficult and problematic conversion, that of the pious and the good, end quote. Protestant religion gets into trouble, Merton says, when, quote, forgetting the seriousness of the need to convert the good, it bogs down in the satisfied complacency of a rather superficial and suburban goodness, the folksy togetherness, the handshaking fellowship, the garrulous witness of moral platitudes. In this, of course, Protestants are often outdistanced by the more complex and sometimes more vulgar inanities of the good Catholic." End quote. How often do we substitute perfunctory goodness for a genuine loving engagement with others? I think of how easily I write a check to help the homeless and of how hard it is for me to look a homeless person in the eye. I'm reminded of a Peanuts cartoon in which the character Linus says, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. Reacting against both the busyness of our materialistic culture and the superficial goodness of religion as it can be practiced in our churches, many people these days are searching for spirituality in new places. Too often, however, New Age and other spiritual practices tempt us with cheap transcendence. Handed a mantra or mandala, mandala or medicine wheel, we do a swift end run past pain and loss, turn the corner on mystery and darkness, and sprint downfield toward bliss. I'm as guilty in this department as anyone else. Searching for both spiritual and physical healing in the face of my Lou Gehrig's disease, I've done my share of chanting and drumming. People have massaged my energy field and consorted with celestial beings on my behalf. I have on my desk a packet containing the ashes of the burnt hair of some saintly man living in India. A kind and intelligent woman gave me this after a sermon I delivered in her church. Apparently I'm supposed to eat the ashes or drink them in tea, and I might just do it. I can't say what good all these things have done me other than provide some hours of distraction from the rigors of my imperfect life. Some days it's simply easier to contemplate my chakras than to contemplate the mystery of my failing flesh, just as sometimes it's easier to embrace a realm of pure light than a world containing cranky children and a sink full of dirty dishes. To choose the world, then, doesn't mean to evade it through busyness or to rest in easy moral certitudes or to imagine that surrendering to God's will is something like surrendering to a hammock on a Sunday afternoon. But then, how do we choose the world, and on what terms? We begin by recognizing that the world is not separate from ourselves. Honoring the world in all its complexity, all its light and shadow, means honoring myself most fully, and recognizing that the world and I have a common source. When I hold the berry in my hand, and when in contemplation of that bit of sacredness I begin to vanish, there's a sense in which the berry too vanishes, as though we were but two drops returned to the well of being. To see the world in this way, as Thomas Merton writes, quote, means not the rejection of a reality but the unmasking of an illusion. The world as pure object is something that is not there. It is not a reality outside us for which we exist. We and our world interpenetrate." End quote. Rather than seeing the visible world as the limit or circumference of the invisible one, then at such moments in the berry patch we no longer see a difference between visible and invisible, matter and spirit. These distinctions simply disappear. 
Emerson himself, in pulling back from strict transcendentalism, arrived at this view eventually. Using a striking metaphor, he writes, quote, Nature is so pervaded with human life that there is something of humanity in all and in every particular. Therefore, spirit, that is, the supreme being, does not build up nature around us, but puts it forth through us, as the life of the tree puts forth new branches and leaves through the pores of the old. End quote. In other words, the world we choose hasn't been imposed on us from without, but comes into being through us. In every moment we collaborate in the ongoing work of creation, including the creation of ourselves. For Joan Chittister, the Benedictine monastic, quote, we work because the world is unfinished and it is ours to develop, end quote. Work, therefore, becomes a sacred responsibility, and choosing the world means choosing what we ourselves have made. As Merton writes, quote, It's only in assuming full responsibility for our world, for our lives, and for ourselves, that we can be said to live really for God, end quote. To be responsible is to be responsive, to respond. All these words have their root in the Latin spondeo, which means to promise. To respond is not to promise for the first time, but to promise again. Not to begin a relationship, but to renew one. One evening this spring, I sat at the dinner table with my children, Amelia and Aaron, ages seven and almost nine. The first flies were hatching and drawn to the light of the house gathering on the window pane near us. Struck with a sudden enthusiasm, the kids got pencils and paper and began to draw. Ignoring the moths and more obvious bugs, they chose as their subject a tiny white-winged fly, perhaps two millimeters wide, so small you wouldn't have noticed it unless you were looking hard. Now my son, the older of the two, had had some practice at such things. But my daughter's drawings had so far been limited in subject to standard, if charming, flowers and rainbows and butterflies and little brown-haired girls. She had never tried drawing a tiny white fly, or in fact to draw anything at all that was actually before her in the world, rather than summoned from her imagination. And sure enough, her first sketch of the fly looked suspiciously like those brightly colored butterflies that had flown beneath so many smiling suns in the works that until then made up her principal oeuvre. When I suggested she go back and look more closely at the fly's antennas, you could see the flash of recognition in her face. She got up from the table and crouched by the window. She looked, she looked again, she pressed her nose to the glass, and <clears throat> she returned to the table. Erasing what she had drawn before, she first got the antennas right, then went back to the window to study the legs. Each time she came back to the table, her paper got more smudged with erasures, but she managed to get the right number of legs in the right places and bent at the correct angles, then to tackle the wings, the body, the head. Our responsibilities to the world are many and complex, yet they seem to begin here in this simple yet arduous act of seeing the world and responding, renewing our promise to it. I sometimes imagine that if the creator of the universe wanted to take another shot at communicating what was most important, she might replace all of sacred scripture with the words, pay attention. To choose the world means, first of all, to see it clearly, to shed fantasy and habit, to look and look again, to let ourselves be broken open by its intricacy and its mystery. It's fitting that one source for the word religion, the word religion, is a group of words meaning to read again, for we must return to the book of the world for a closer reading. 
Only when we have read and reread with open mind and heart can we fruitfully carry on God's work. Then, picking up our pencils, we continue the world's unfinished text. Again, I may have made all this sound too easy, as though looking at bugs and berries were all that were required for our enlightenment. The problem is that seeing is never plain. The woman who has just found a new lover gazes out her kitchen window at the overgrown lawn and sees their luxuriance, a wild and delicious excess. The man who has just lost his job looks out the same window at the same lawn and sees more evidence of his decline. There is always something behind our seeing, something prior to it. Even the so-called objective standpoint of the scientist, however valuable and important, is not an absolute frame of reference, but rather grows out of a particular set of interests and concerns. Thus the question rises, if we must see the world clearly in order to choose it, what world must we see? This question has long been the province of various ologies, epistemology, phenomenology, ontology, that have kept generations of philosophy professors busy. But the basic issues at stake are not easy enough to grasp. Choosing the world in the way I mean it takes something in addition to scientific seeing, something that I'll call mystical seeing. Now I know that in a culture where scientific, rational, and secular values dominate, the word mystical has at best come to stand for all that is uselessly poetic and obscure, and at worst has become a synonym for mistaken, fuzzy-headed, or just plain wacko. But mystical experience isn't all that unusual. Most of us have found that a line of poetry or scripture, a passage of music, the turning of a leaf in sunlight, or the sight of a child splashing in a stream can suddenly become a doorway through which, as William James writes, quote, the mystery of fact, the wildness and the pang of life, steals into our hearts and thrills them, close quote. Each of the world religions has a mystical tradition wherein such experiences are cultivated and understood within the context of a person's normal spiritual development. We have in large part lost touch with these traditions. And these days, most people encounter them only in distorted New Age forms that can make them seem at odds with reason and the demands of everyday life. That's a pity, for as a rational mystic, I found that by integrating my mystical side with my scientific one, I'm best able every day to renew my promise to a world vitally charged with meaning. I would have us learn to see as both scientists and mystics, for we need both kinds of vision for the fullest possible apprehension of life. I know a man who gained an international reputation as a botanical illustrator, selling his work regularly to National Geographic and other publications. For years he drew plants and insects not only with scientific accuracy, but great artistic beauty. And yet, for all his practiced attention to small things, for all his reading and rereading of the book of the world, he did not see his art as a spiritual activity. Then, after spending time among Native Americans in the Southwest, he learned to see in a new way. The world had become sacred to him. The shift to mystic seeing transformed his art along with the rest of his life. He now does relatively little illustration work, instead making paintings that he considers a form of prayer. Explaining this to me one day in his studio, he showed me a piece that dramatized this shift in vision. The painting depicted a monarch butterfly and a single leaf of a begonia, each rendered in the exquisite detail and brilliant pigment of his former scientific work. In this painting, however, 
the butterfly and leaf float over a formless charcoal sky through which drifts a full moon. Thus the scientific vision emerges from the mystical one with order and precision set against a background of chaos and mystery. Scientific seeing, for good reasons, seeks to fix the world like a bug pinned to a tray, wants to make it fully present to our rational understanding. Mystical seeing, on the other hand, discovers both presence and absence equally. When I hold the berry in my hand, when I surrender myself wholly to its presence, I know I'm in the presence of the divine. But at the same time, I come to know the mystery, the berry, as a mystery beyond my comprehension. And I come to know God as that which is essentially unknowable. Mystical seeing always involves this paradox, and thus can be as harrowing as it is uplifting. To approach God is to know the infinite distance between God and us. To know God is to enter what one medieval mystic called the cloud of unknowing. Each moment of light and clarity brings darkness and confusion. I possess all knowledge, all wisdom, all joy, and at the same moment, I'm empty and cast down, groveling with Job before the voice out of the whirlwind. Mystical seeing exalts us at the same time as it knocks us out of our complacency, our confidence, our righteousness. That's why true mystics have so often been labeled troublemakers and heretics. They refuse the comforts of orthodoxy. To live in the world opened up by this larger perspective requires what Keats called negative capability. The poet's ability to be, quote, in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason, end quote. The mystic, like the poet, like all of us who seek the fullest apprehension of life, must leave the settled world of the known to dwell in the wilderness of mystery. But, you can choose the world without writing poetry or living in a desert cave. You need no equipment other than the human heart. The anonymous medieval mystic who wrote The Cloud of Unknowing tells us that, quote, all rational beings possess two faculties, the power of knowing and the power of loving. To the first, to the intellect, God who made them is forever unknowable. But to the second, to love, he is completely knowable, and that by every separate individual. End quote. We must see the world as scientists, but first as lovers. Growing up in a world fearful of mystery, we've fallen out of the habit and must relearn it. We must love the world with a child's love for its parents a love immediate and unreserved, no matter, no matter that the world gives us both blueberries and the black flies that torment us as we pick them. We must love the world with the love of a mother or father for her or his two-year-old child, the one with the scabby knees and runny nose and the lungs of a future opera singer running toward us now with whatever gob of creation, wasp nest or wisteria or worm, it is clutched in its gleeful fist. We must love the world as new lovers do each other, as if to be in the beloved's presence is to walk through a world made newly luminous, finding that every ordinary gesture, the way he drops his car keys on the table, the way she raises a cup to her lips, is holy and part of a sacred dance. Mystic vision is a lover's vision, and despite the pain love brings, to see the world through a lover's eyes is already to have chosen it. Our first act upon entering the world is to draw breath, to take some of its substance into ourselves. And with our first exhalation, we give something of ourselves 
back to the world. The world moves through us as we move through the world. Each breath, a response, a renewal of that original promise. To choose the world is to return to where we began, to follow love to its source, to rest in that ground of our being that has no beginning and no ending. Moved by love of the world, we venture all to enter the sacred circle, to cross the threshold of the invisible, to draw closer to God. When at last we find ourselves there, inside the world's holy heart, we discover we have been there all along. Born of the world, we give birth to the world in every moment. Beloved of the world, we are every moment in its embrace. Choosing the world, we discover in the end that the world has already chosen us. Choosing the World, Chapter 8 of Philip Simmons' 